Well, how many believe it's the best year ever? Yeah. Amen. And we're recalled this year. That's our theme for the year, to be recalled. I got a quick story for you. Uh, how many like the story? Okay. How many like stories? Just wave at me. Okay. And, and you can practice your giggler a little bit here, because even if it isn't that funny, you can still laugh. Okay, it'll make me feel better, and you'll have ministered to me then. Um, here, there was a boy who was in a Sunday school class, and, and the teacher was teaching about creation. And one of the things that were really particular to him that he really got caught on was the part where when God created woman, he took the rib from Adam's side, and he made woman. And that was something kind of interesting to him. And so about a week and a half later, uh, you know, he, he put that in his memory bank. About a week and a half later, he wasn't feeling very well, and, and, and his mother could see that he wasn't feeling very well, and, and he was laying down, this little Johnny was laying down on his bed, and his mom came in and said, honey, what's the matter? And he goes, I have a pain in my side. I think I'm going to have a wife. <laughs> now let me follow that up with why should we pray? <laughs> you will not pray if you feel like you're obligated to pray. You're not going to pray if you feel that's just what Christians do. You're not going to pray if you think, well, that's, you know, I, I feel ashamed or I feel guilty or I feel condemned when I don't pray. And so I'm praying because I want to feel better. That's, that's not going to cause any of us to pray. If, if I were to stand up here and we're in a series called Pray, this is the second message of the series called Pray. If I were to stand up here and I were here to give you the best guilt trip that I could give you and I guilted you into pray, you might feel real, real bad. You might even come to the altar and repent at your inability to pray somehow and ask God and beg God to help you to want to pray, but you aren't going to pray. You will not start praying until you understand why we should pray. See, prayer is not something you do to prove that you're a believer. Prayer is not something you do to prove that you're righteous. Prayer is not something you do to say that I'm holy. Prayer is something you do because you cannot live without it. When you come to the understanding of the gift of prayer and the power of prayer in our life, when you understand how powerful it is to change our life, then you'll wake up in the morning saying, you know what, I need to pray today. Because prayer will change my situation. And it can change your situation, it should. You know what I've found is, a lot of times, at least in my life, I don't know about your life, a lot of times I think, well, I, I need to pray about this, and I'll pray one time, and then I'll stop. Now, if you didn't hear the message last week, you need to go online and listen to the message last week, because it really sets kind of a step in which this step is going to build on, and, and talking about the sovereignty of God, and, and really what that means, and in the immutability of God, and what that means. But what, a lot of times what we do is when we go to pray about something, we'll pray about it, and then we don't pray anymore. And we'll pray about it one time, and then if, if it happens, that's great. If it doesn't happen, we sit there and go, I guess God doesn't answer my prayers. We're almost like, like weak. Do we understand that there is a, now some of you think, boy, you're weird and kind of peculiar. Well, yes, I, thank you very much. <laughs> it won't take you long to realize that my goal is not to try to be the coolest chick in, in, in this world, but to just be peculiar. Because that's what God's calling us to. You know, I think in a lot of ways, Christians are trying to be more acceptable to the world. That they give away a lot of the characteristic God's trying to put in them. I can't change the fact that I believe certain things. This last week, and I'll get to it here in a moment, but this last week... We, Bailey, uh, last Friday, a week from this last fri Friday, tore ACL. They said they, she tore a bunch of ligaments. And after going through that with Bianca, you know, it was just, just a pain to think that we we're going to have to go through it again with Bailey. And I went to the surgeon. We went to the surgeon, and she said, first of all, only one is tore, the ACL. The rest, there's nothing wrong. In fact, they look great. 
So praise the Lord for the miracle that none of them are else, right? I'm sitting there going. And I said, you know I'm a pastor. And she goes, yes. And then I'm sure in her mind she's thinking, what's coming next? I said, listen, I believe in the power of healing. I've seen the power of healing. And I said, before you touch that knee, I believe God's going to heal that ACL. Now, I'm telling all of you this morning, I told the first service and I'll tell the third, I'm putting myself out there and I'm putting myself out there because John 14, 15, and 16 says, ask anything, anything. It didn't say anything but ACLs. It didn't say anything but it said anything, which in my book still, anything is everything. And it shall be done for those. And I've went to the Lord and said, God, I didn't tell you to write that. I didn't put it down. I, I didn't say, God, I didn't say, God, you should promise this. God, you gave it as your word. You said it. I'm just holding you to your word. That's it. Just like a good child does. But you said, Dad, and I said, listen, before you touch that need, I want you to make sure we actually got to do the, Bailey, she's like, Dad, can you tell them before they cut the knee? Because I really don't want to scar if they really didn't have to do the surgery. Right? I said, check it, make sure. You know why? Because I believe God has the power to do that. You know, 1,200 teenagers on Tuesday night were praying for her by name. In Michigan. Now listen to me. God answers prayer. We must pray. Not because it makes us better Christians. Not because it makes me more righteous or more holy. We need prayer because I live. Because I live in a world that is dark and broken and lost. And I'm fighting a battle against spiritual forces that I cannot see with my eyes. And I can't physically beat up with my fist. I can only do it through the power and the weapons and the warfare of prayer. It is only through prayer where I commission the spiritual forces of heaven to get battle the, the spiritual forces of darkness, the principalities and powers that are in this area that we battle on a daily basis even though we don't know we're battling against them. You know, the Bible says we don't fight against flesh and blood. I'm not battling against the person in my workplace or the person in my neighborhood. I'm not battling against the person on the highway that just pulled in front of me this morning and then flipped me off because they pulled in front of me. I'm not battling them. I'm battling against that traffic principality that seems to be out there somewhere. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. Someone's just instead of yelling at them, he's just, I cast the demon out of that finger right now in the name of Jesus. You just go fly right back to hell where you came from. How many are with me this morning? There's power in prayer. You know, there was a boy, he was praying. He said, Dad, I'm praying that, that, you, have a, that you give me a brother. And, 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 the, and the father said, okay, well, you better pray about it. And he said, I, I will. And the boy prayed a month, and, and, and the baby didn't come. And he prayed two months, and the baby didn't come. So he prayed a third month. And the baby didn't come. And he says, I guess God doesn't answer my prayer. So he stopped. About six months later, the dad said, son, i got to take you somewhere. He took him down to the hospital. He pulled the current back and says, see, here's your, your little brother. He was all excited. He says, oh, you're not done. He pulled it back a little further, and there was the second little brother. <laughs> he says, oh, that is great. He pulled it back a little further, there was a third little brother. And the, and the father said, aren't you glad you prayed for a little brother? He goes, yeah, but aren't you glad I stopped at three months? <laughs> <laughs> when we pray, God answers, right? But that doesn't mean it, it happens right then and there. I think a lot of Christians, we give up too quickly. We stop praying because in some way the enemy gets us convinced it's too hard. It's not hard to pray. It's hard to fight. So stop fighting and start praying. Let God take control of it. You know, the hardest part of it is prayer says, I'm not able to do this, God. I give it to you. Prayer takes the control from you and gives it to God. A lot of us would just rather do it ourselves because we're afraid of how God might choose to do it. Right? Yet God is working on your behalf right now. It says he's an intercessor for you right now. 
Now, I believe one of the things that I think we do too little in the church, and one of the things we're doing online, you'll see a lot of videos online of people that meet with you at Bethel's Rock and your family at B-Rock. They're giving testimonies. I don't think we testify enough. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. I don't think we testify enough of what God is doing in his power. Because So then when we go through something, we haven't really heard a lot of the. We always hear the story. You know, you're going through something. Somebody says, well, you should hear what I went through. My aunt, my great aunt Elsie had cancer and she lost both legs and two thumbs. You know, thank you. You don't tell people that. Hey, I'm going through cancer. Yeah, I'm, 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 Anna Alberta, she lost her liver because it, right? How many know what I'm talking about? And they're like, oh, thank you for, for pulling me down. Thank you for deflating my faith right now, praise the Lord. You know, God does far more miracles than there are ever stories of things where things didn't happen the way we hoped it would. We just don't talk about them as much. You know, God split the Red Sea, and now we got scientists trying to say science is there's a science. How about just say God split the Red Sea? Do I need to know if he blew his nostrils and it split, or if there was some undercurrent that just caused it to go up because an alligator? You know, some, some stupid thing, right? God did something supernatural. Praise the Lord. I'm okay with that. I don't need a scientific explanation, right? You want to hear something else? Molly's going to come up here. Molly Moon's going to come up here. And she's going to share a testimony of what happened with her grandfather. Oh, that's right. Um, so my grandma passed away about two months ago. And her husband, my grandpa, was really, really healthy, really sharp mind. And a couple weeks ago, he went in for just a routine colonoscopy. And while he was under, his heart just stopped. And he was gone. Um, but they were able to do CPR, and they revived him, but he was still unconscious. And so they airlifted him to St. Cloud and... Um, my mom called me crying, and she was on her way up there, and within three hours, she called me and said, we're going to take him off life support. They said he has extreme brain damage. He's basically a vegetable, and we know he doesn't want that. So you need to come up so we can say goodbye. So anyone near, we all went up, and we spent hours just praying over him. And um, I know that having the tool of speaking in tongues, for those of you who I experienced that. It's amazing because when you don't know what to pray anymore, <laughs> you just put your hand on them and you pray and pray in your, in your spirit language. And we just prayed for a few hours and we said goodbye to my grandpa in shock because the day before he was fine. And um, they pulled the plug and we waited as we kind of saw his breathing slow and we were expecting him to go and he just kind of hung on and hung on. And we asked the nurse like, okay, like what should we do? And she said, well, sometimes it takes like a day so some of us stayed the night um, just so we could be with him. In the morning, early morning, they moved him to an overflow of the hospital while he was in his care and was going to pass away. And so we went around the hospital, and we went up to his room. We walked in, and my grandpa was sitting up looking at us. <laughs> and <laughs> we were in shock, and we were amazed. And um, when he first woke up, he seemed to have a lot of brain damage. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know he was a grandpa. He didn't know my dad. He knew my mom, but he was really confused, couldn't talk much. So we were trying to readjust, okay, God. Is, he, my dad kept saying, God, is this your best? And we kept praying for him. We kept believing and kept praying. And I can tell you that after a week in the hospital, my grandpa is home. He has a complete mind and a complete body, and God completely healed him. That's what your God does. And, and what we're going to talk about is the fact that God does something. I went to that surgeon, and, and I told her that. She just looked at me with the eyes, and I said, this may seem weird, but I believe God can do it. And I've told many people, I believe God's word. Do you believe God's word? Do you believe he has ever failed his word? And you say, well, he never has for people I know, but it just doesn't seem like he does for me. Friend, if he doesn't for anyone else, he doesn't for you. God is not different God is not a different God to Hitler than he is to you. Did you, did you hear that? I can't think of a, another, I'm sure in history there's probably someone that's more evil than that and what that was and that was espoused through his life. But I'm going to tell you right now, God is the same God that had mercy and love for him as he did for you. And God can use you just as he can use anyone else in history that has been powerful. You know why? Because the same power 
that operates through a Reinhard Bonnke or a Smith Wigglesworth or anyone else you read in history that did great science is living inside of you. So I want to ask you some questions here this morning. Uh, six questions. Whoops. See the miracle of me catching that. <laughs> that was not planned. First question, does God have all power? Yes. yes. Now, the next questions I don't want you to answer. I just want you to think about them, okay? So don't, don't answer, right? For God to release that power, do we need to pray? Do we need to pray? Here's the second one. Do we bother God enough to get him to finally release power through prayer? And that comes out of the scripture, Luke 18, that says the unjust uh, uh, judge was bothered so, so much that he did something, yet God is not an unjust judge. But if we bother him enough, will he do something? Here's the fourth question. When we pray, are we trying to talk God into it? Are we trying to talk God into it? Number fifth question, does it require a certain amount of prayer for certain situations? Number six, do we earn answers to our prayers? See, sometimes we think when we pray, it's based on how good of a person I am and not on the character of God. God answers prayer not based on your character, but based on his character. Okay? I was just coming in here. Um, Gwen, where's Gwen? Where's Gwen at? There she is right there. She came up to me. She says, who is it that did that Bible study? Is he going to be here today? Well, he's here. He's right there. Uh, John laid hands on her. She had migraines that would not stop ever, would they? Or they were all the time, right? And she came up and said, he healed me of my migraines. Yeah. On, on Wednesday night. Now, some of you are just, that's so nice. All that you never have a migraine, you would not clap like that at all. You'd be like shouting unto the Lord, praise the Lord. God takes them away. There's something to shout about. Because there, there is something, whether you like it or not, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, there's something living in you. And I want to take a look at this. First, here's the first point I want to make tonight. God has dis deposited power in us and upon us. God has deposited power in us and upon us, okay? So it doesn't matter who you are, what you do. Does anyone have in here credentials to be a pastor? Just raise your hand if you, if you have credentials, okay? Great, because you're the only people who can pray for the sick and they'll recover. <laughs> you're the only ones. Because, because when you got credentialed, you were instilled with power. Everyone else, sorry. Maybe next, next lifetime. Maybe, you know, some other point in history, but just nah, on you. Can I tell you, just because you're a pastor, you have credentials, you're, that doesn't make you more powerful. The same power that was in Christ is in me, and the same power that's in me is in you. And when we get to a, a heaven... To whom much is given, much is required. We will all give an account for the power for which he put in you. You will give an account and how you use that power which he gave to you. You ever thought about that? Here's, here's what it said. I want to show you this in Luke 24, 29. It says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem and tell your what? endued with power from on high. We know it's the Holy Spirit resting on you. Next verse. Next, 1, eight. it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. He rests on you. Right, now let me, let me look at this because it's power. There's power that rests on you. There's power that lives in you that when you were saved, that Christ came, his power came and lived in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you and he rests upon you. Say, in me. I have power, and I got power on my head, okay? You operate in that. Now, that's who you are, okay? Now, let me show you another scripture. It's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And some of you may say, well, you say that almost every week. But this really is. 
like one of my favorite verses in the Bible, okay? It says in the in a, in an IV, it says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. How many remember how that verse ends? How, how many know how that, we know this first part, we have all heard this, but it's the last part I want to look at. Well, I know you do, Pastor Phil, back you. <laughs> There's no doubt. He's raising his hand, I know. It's, look at it, here's how it ends. Here's how it ends. You want to say it, Pastor? That's right. According to the power that's at work within us. So in the New King James, it's interesting because there's a, there's a verb, in, there, there's adverbs in here I want to take a look at, and I didn't get the New King James up here. I wanted to do that. But in the New King James, it uses exceedingly, abundantly, above all. You could ask or imagine. All you needed to say there was all. I mean, God didn't need to put in all the adverbs. If God says any, all the things you ask or imagine, it would have said that there's nothing beyond all, right? But God goes, just in case they don't get it, because I know them, I'm going to say, he who is able to do above all things, they could ask or imagine. No, that's not good enough. I got to add a little bit more. He who is able to do abundantly above all things. That, that's still not good enough. He says, I want to put, he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all things you could ask or even imagine. That means they don't leave anything else out there. No matter what you're going through, no matter what the devil's telling you, I don't think it fits outside of that category. I think God wanted to make a point to say no matter what it is you're facing, I am able to do it, I am willing to do it, I want to do it, I desire to do it, and I'm going to do it. If you will just ask, according to the power that is working inside of you, there is power working in you this morning, whether you realize it or not. Amen? I, okay, I'm going to start asking. Start asking! You should have started a long time ago. Is God able to do exceedingly abundantly above all things that you ask for? Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. Then start asking right now, just in your own way. Say, God, right now I'm asking in my life, Lord God, in my marriage, in my finances, you start asking right now. Just start asking. This isn't a thing where I just get up here and preach and you shout and then we go and we leave and we don't do it. Right now, just start asking. Close your eyes right now and just say, God, I'm asking right now for that kid that is lost and running from you. We ask him to come back. We're asking for him to come right back, Lord, right now. And this marriage that is not working, this relationship that's not working, God, you work it out. You do things that have to physically change to make this work. I pray that you physically do it in the name of Jesus. Right now, you just ask. If it's a ministry you're in or a job you're at or a career you're in, a neighborhood you're in, you got a neighbor that's a bonehead, you just say, Lord, I lift up my boneheaded neighbor that needs to know you. Amen? Okay, here's God's, on, well, let me make this statement first. Because according, actually, measurement is an actual word of measurement. It's kata in the Greek. Kata in the Greek. It denotes measurement or distribution. Kata. And, and so it's a distributing the power according to the measurement, according to how I distribute the power that's at work in me. So we all have the same measurement of power, but how are we distributing it among those people around us? So look at this. Uh, it's actually C-A-T-A. According to us, they're going to change that. that from the first service, it wasn't there. And uh, according to his power, next, next one, the statement I want to make here. Okay? And God's unlimited power is limited to our prayers. Remember, you had to heard last week's series, message. Because you say, well, if God's, God's going to do whatever he wants, God's just going to do it, why do I need God will not do it if you do not pray. You say, well, it's God's will. It's God's desire to do it, but your prayer brings his desire from heaven and brings it to earth. 
Why do you think Jesus prayed when he was on earth? He was God. He, would, he understood, I'm bringing the desire of heaven and I'm bringing it to earth. He demonstrated, even the Son of God demonstrated it on earth. The only thing keeping God from doing unlimited things on earth is the way we pray. And how we pray and the faith we pray and the way we pray. So we need to start praying. How many say, okay, so you're saying some of the issues of my life are due to the fact and the reason God isn't moving is because I'm not asking. I'm not praying. I'm not, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. You have to distribute the power that's work in you. You have to, here's the next point. Here's the next point. You have to release the power. We must release his power through prayer. The power to change your life, to change your neighborhood, to change your workplace, to change the people in your life is already in you, but you have to release it. And you do that through prayer. You do that through prayer. Our weapons of warfare is not punching our fists. Our weapons of warfare are prayer, getting on our hands and knees. That's why I said last week, protesting has never changed anything. Pray testing is how everything changes. When we stand together in prayer, we move mountains. Here's, here's what it says in John. You know, and, and we're going to, the releasing the power of God. And I, and I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share it anyway. There, there is a situation, and I just forgot it. I came down to share it, and I just forgot it. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, fix my memory right now. I was, I'm going to share you something. I pastored in Michigan. For those who don't know, I was a pastor there for 15 years. And... Um, and uh, I was walking through the lobby. I'm a very single task person. Anyone single task person, you, like when you're on a task, you, like, you can walk right by people and not even know they're there. That's, that's kind of like me. Like, I like bottom line things. I don't need all the details. I don't need the cherry and the whipped cream. Just give me the frappuccino, right? Just, just right to the point. I don't need all that stuff. Well, um, I'm walking through the lobby, and I'm set on a goal, and I have something, and, I, and when I'm walking, I'm like processing it in my mind, what I'm going to do when I get there, and I'm walking, and I had no idea. It's a big lobby. It was a big, big lobby, and I'm walking through, and, and as I'm walking through, I didn't notice the woman that was sitting there, and, and, um, and she, she goes, Pastor James, and I didn't even hear her the first time say anything because I was so focused in what I was doing, and I'm walking in. She goes, Pastor James, and I stopped, and I'm like, who's this woman that stopped me? Like... <laughs> This is your pastor. Aren't you proud of him? Like, I don't have time to help you, woman. I got stuff to do, right? So I'm, I'm walking along, and she stops me, and she goes, Pastor, can I get carpal to my hands. I've just been pain, and for the last three months, my hands are just, and, and they can't fix it, and it's pain. And I said, Okay, so I lay hands and I go, in the name of Jesus, I speak life over your wrist, and, and that you be held and be in order. Amen. God bless you, sister. You know, go on in peace, right? And, and, I, and I took off walking, right? Now, you know, you're sitting here thinking, yeah, are you, yeah, can you believe that? I'm sorry, but that's the truth, okay? I know none of you are like that, right? At least I stopped. I could have pretended like I didn't hear her. The next Sunday morning, I come back to church, and she comes running up to the front. As soon as she gets there, she comes up, and she goes, Pastor James, I'm totally healed. My, my wrists are completely healed. I have absolutely no pain. They went, in, they went in to check to see what was going on. They said, you have no signs of carpal tunnel, nothing at all. I'm sitting there. I'm shocked out of my mind. I'm like, what in the world? How did that happen? I didn't even, like, have faith. I didn't even, like, believe. It was like an afterthought. I expected nothing to take place. Can you believe that? But God wanted a vessel that would be willing to release power. And the power that was in work in me was released and it healed that body. And he just needed a rock at the moment to do it. Right? Now, when you're in your workplace and you got a bunch of sick people around you, you got people who are hurting, he doesn't need some PhD, DH, DSD, HD, DD, BDA, BCD, ABC <laughs> credentialed person 
for that. Say, all he needs is somebody who has the belief that when they pray and release power, they can see things happen in people's lives and they happen. Todd White, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you've heard of the gentleman. I was listening to him talk, and, and Arizona was on vacation in Phoenix. And for a year and a half, no one was healed when he would pray for them to be healed. For a year and a half, no one got healed, but he kept praying. So, so Todd White said one time when he began, no one was being healed, but he believed in the power that was in him at work, and he would release the power, nothing would happen, nothing would happen. But at one point, he prayed for a guy's back, and the back was healed. And ever since that point, people have been getting at an 80% pace that he prays for. Now, I'm telling you, do you not get this? The power of prayer releases the power that's at work in you. The power in prayer is the power in you being released. So whether it's your situation and where you're at and what you're facing, you're just replacing the resurrection power of Christ that lives in you and the power of the Holy Spirit that rests on you. You're, you're focusing it and releasing it into a direction. You are a powerful weapon when you pray in darkness. You are a powerful weapon when you pray in darkness because darkness has to go. Brokenness has to go. It's not just healing of bodies. I mean, I'm telling you testimonies of healing in bodies. I, I'm talking is when you start to believe that when I pray, I don't care if the miracle happens or not. I know I'm just going to release power. What happens is, is, is in his hands. I'm just releasing power right now, the power that's in me, and I expect something to take place. 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 I, right now, in the name of Jesus, to the thing like a veil over the eyes of men, I command those cataracts to come off your spiritual eyes and for the hairs in your ears to be shaved so you can hear the voice of the Lord speak truth to you and cause faith to arise as you hear the promises of God in your life. You say, well, I just got saved two months ago. I got saved, well, praise God, the same power that's in you is in me. Start using it down. Don't get old and crotchety. Not use the power that's in you. Amen? So release the power in you. Now, let me look at, there's a scripture in John 7, 37 through 39. It says this. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Why? Why did he say that? Because he fully intended to give them something to drink. Not because he's telling. When Christ says something in the scriptures, he told us it because he fully intended for us to hold them to it. It goes on. It says, he cried out, if anyone's thirsty, let him come into me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures, it says, out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believe in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What he was saying is, there is living water that was come. Now, where does living water come from? It comes from the rock. And, and, and when Moses called water from the rock, the water that came out of the rock in, in Jewish uh, thinking was living water. And they were calling for water that would come out of the rock. We know the rock to be Jesus was the rock and he says there's living water that's going to come out of me this was a feast for eight days what happened was for seven of those days they prayed for living water and there was no living water and on the eighth day they just decided since we didn't get any living water let's just pray for rain what Jesus was saying, it's not wrong to pray for rain, but what he's saying is pray for living water. Don't go to second best just because you don't think you got it. Don't give up on it. Don't stop praying. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Don't stop praying because you didn't get it today. Keep praying. Zechariah 14, 8 says, On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea, half to the western sea, in the summer and in the winter. It was the promise. And Jesus says, I am the living water, and out of me will flow living waters to us. Keep praying. And, and literally what Jesus was saying is you give up praying too easily. Don't stop praying. Keep praying. Keep praying praying keep praying whatever it is you prayed for keep praying that thing which you want that dream you want keep praying you want children keep praying if you want a spouse keep praying somebody say amen, amen. 
That wasn't good enough, guys. Come on, somebody say amen. You know, some of us have more faith in the hot water heater than we do the promises of God. I don't know about you, but in the middle of January, in my house on the second floor, I think the furthest from the hot water heater is our shower. And when I wake up in the morning, I turn that lever to hot. And I put my hand in there, and you know what it is? It ain't hot. So I turn it off and say, honey, we got no hot water. No, I have faith. I put it in there. It's going to get hot. It's going to get hot. I keep my hand in the shower because I know it's going to get hot. And then I don't, uh, after, t- after 10 seconds, I don't shut it off because I think, well, I guess it didn't work. My hot water heater's not working. No, I know I'm just going to sit there because I know that eventually that thing's going to get hot. And there are situations in your life where you get down and say, dear Jesus, will you help me, help us with it? Will you do a mirror? And, it, and it didn't happen. Keep your hand in the water. Second time, get, Jesus, will you do this? Not happening. Keep your hand in the water. It's on its way. The hot water isn't there yet, but it's on its way. The moment I turned that faucet, the hot water was being sent. And let me tell you something. The moment you start praying, the answer is on your way. Don't shut it off before it gets there. Get your hand back in the water. Oh, no, God, I know that you promised that you were going to take care of this in our life, but it's not feeling like you get your hand in the water. Don't pull it out. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Don't turn the faucet off of your prayer before it gets there. Here's the third point. Well, let me, let me give you this example before I get to the third point. Here, here it is. Daniel 10, 2 through 3. I love this part. This is one of my favorite Old Testament verses. <laughs> Portions of verses right here. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. You know why he was mourning three full weeks? Because he was trying to eat right and exercise. <laughs> Can't make anybody mourn, right? <laughs> he said, I ate no unpleasant food, no meat or wine, no Cheetos, basically all those things that we love. He ate none of that stuff, right? I ate no unpleasant food, no meat and wine, came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. Now everyone else is mourning because the guy stinks, okay? Till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Then he said to him, do not fear, Daniel. This is the angel Lord. This is what he said to Daniel after this. This is the angel Lord came to Daniel. He said, do not fear, Daniel. You know what I love about that is that he calls him by name. Because God just does that. God knows your name. He says, do not fear. Do not fear, Bill. Do not fear, Tina. Do not fear. Look what he says. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. Look at this next verse. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 20, the principalities of that area withstood me 21 days because there's demonic forces trying to keep the answers of God from coming into your life. You have to understand that. The enemy is working against the answer of God in your life. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. But Michael came and got the promise released. You know why we keep praying? Because there's a battle over your answered prayer going on right now. God has always answered your prayer from the first word. But you keep praying because you're warring the, the spiritual forces that are trying to prevent that to get from getting to you. So you just keep asking. Get your hand back in the water. Keep asking. Keep asking. That's why you bind up that which... That which you bind up on earth has already been bound up in heaven, and that which you release on earth has already been released in heaven. Amen. Are you with me this morning? It's time to get your prayers out of prison. Get your answered prayers out of the jail they're in right now. You just break them free. You do that just by praying. I'm going to keep praying because they can't stay there. Amen. Okay, look at this last point. God adds his fire power to your prayers. 
God adds your fire. This is very quick point. I'm going to end on this here. In Revelations 5, 8, this is what it says. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, and each having a harp and a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Say this with me. Pray with me. Repeat after me. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in my life. And right now, I give you the burden that I'm carrying. And name it. Name it. If it's a child, if it's finances, if it's health, just say, I give it. Just name that. Okay? Did you do it? Did you do it? Okay. Thank you, God, that you know that you're willing and that you'll fulfill it. Today, I give you my whole life, my health, my relationships, my finances, my dreams. Do with it as you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know what we just did? We just filled a bowl in heaven. So God's got like a room with all of these bowls in them, some, like some of you ladies do, except you can use them. <laughs> right? And, and there are bowls in heaven, and, and what happens is, is there's so many prayers. God's like, I got to hold these, I got to store these prayers somewhere. And so he stores the prayers in these bowls in heaven. So every prayer you've ever prayed from the time that you were two years old to the time that you're 102 years old, every prayer you pray is remembered by God in those bowls. He doesn't forget any of them. Doesn't forget any of them. They're like cards you get at Father's Day. I got a drawer just for all the cards. And then my daughter made me a card like this, and I'm like, if I'm going to keep them, you got to make them a little smaller. Because you know, they're like, right? Now look what comes next in Revelation. Look at this. Look at this. When he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. Some say that's why there's no women in heaven. <laughs> it's just a joke. It's just a joke. There are no preachers in heaven either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just playing, ladies. I'm just playing. Just playing. It's all good. I might have slipped out of the anointing for a while. Now I'm back. Okay. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And then another angel, having a, look at this, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the, so what does he do? He's taking the incense from the altar, and he's mixing it with the prayers of the saint upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And so the bowl is mixed with the incense of the altar of heaven, creating smoke. They bring it to God, okay? Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thundering, light, and literally what was happening, God was taking the prayers, taking the incense, and whoop, and it created a fire. He took the fire and he threw it back to the earth as answered prayer. Your prayers are literally being joined with the power of heaven and then sent back fulfilled. That's why every prayer you pray has to be fulfilled. It's how God deals with them. And so if you're sitting and you're here and you're sitting, and this is a word for someone, you've been praying for a long time for a relationship in your life and it hasn't changed and you've been doubting whether God even cares, whether he knows, whether he answers. I'm telling you right now, this is a word from the Lord. He knows, he's working on it. Do not fear. He's got it covered. And he will send it back and it will come with such power of noises, thunders, lightning, and earthquakes. It will literally change an atmosphere. That's why a church in a community that believes in the power of prayer can change the whole atmosphere of a city because the prayers of that church come as one body mixed with the incense of God 
like fire, creating such fire. And when he God heaven throws it back to earth, it goes, Poof, and it's like a nuclear weapon that explodes in the community. And it's, you got to envision the nuclear weapon of a, the cloud, the mushroom cloud of, in the atmosphere that when a church prays for its city, it creates such a force. The atmosphere has to change. There is nothing the enemy can do to stop it. That's why Jesus said, this shall be a house of prayer, because it's in this place that we change the atmosphere of everything that takes place around us. We should pray. How many know when you pray, it really does work? And the, all of the thing to keep you from praying, all that force keeping you from praying is not, is not your flat. It's the enemy working against you to keep you from praying because he wants you to wrestle the world and wrestle life all by yourself. And God says, stop trying to do it in yourself. Let it go and just come to me and I will give you rest. How many need some rest? You're, rest you're wrestling all kinds of things in your life, but you need some rest. Here's where it happens. Lord, here I am. I'm asking today and then be at rest. Amen. Will you bow your head?